Hello, everyone. I'd like us to get started here. Thanks for uh, attending. I couldn't be more pleased than to have uh, Brad and Pellins here. Um, I've uh, been uh, aware of his work for some time. I've got to know him well as we've tried to form a special interest group on trans disease processes at the Society of Behavioral Medicine. And it's great to have him here. Brad is a, a health psychologist who studies um, um, many issues related to health behavior as related to obesity. Uh, he's the associate professor uh, in the Department of Preventive Medicine at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where he's also the section director. In, um, he was also a, a previously assistant professor at Arizona State University, and uh, that's where he received his PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, he does a whole bunch of interesting research related to obesity. He does work on developing novel behavioral interventions. He looks at the neurocognitive processes that undergird uh, some of these behaviors. Um, he does epidemiology on the basis of, of, of these disorders, as well as doing work that's related to a, a socioeconomic disparity. Um, what you'll find is he's also remarkably creative. He does these really interesting studies. Um, the one I'll just mention, I don't know if you'll be talking about it or not, he manipulated a uh, vending machine so that he less healthy food took longer to drop <laughs> versus uh, healthy food, which dropped immediately, right? That's just, that's just fascinating. Very cool stuff. So uh, I couldn't be more pleased to have him here to talk about the nature and consequences of present ba biased uh, eating behavior. Brad, thanks for being here. One second. Okay. Yeah, thanks. It is nice to be here. And thanks to all of you who have given me some of your time over the past couple of days to tell me about this place and give me tours. Um, so I have about 83 slides on what delayed discounting is, in case none of you knew about it. Um, I do have to actually disclose intellectual property rights for the vending machine thing we're going to be talking about. I, I think it'd be pretty funny if it actually ended up being a profitable enterprise to, to do that, but I do have to disclose it. Uh, so for today, I want to try to make a case that food purchasing is an important behavior that ultimately does have downstream effects on diet. For a long time, in terms of obesity risk, we've really just focused on ingestive behavior, like the act of actually eating, how much we're eating at a given time, or things like that. And we've really sort of ignored the upstream drivers that lead to the food choices that we end up making. So we'll talk about that and how it relates to diet quality and obesity as well as disparities in purchasing behavior that then may lead to disparities in obesity. Uh, talk about present bias and its relations with all of those obesity-related behaviors. And then as Warren alluded to, we've got a few slides on time delays as one of several types of interventions that might focus on delay discounting. Um, so some of you may have heard a few headlines a couple years ago about how the obesity epidemic was leveling off, particularly with kids. And it turns out that, unfortunately, that's not really the case. We still see that the obesity epidemic is getting worse. And it still continues to have a whole variety of negative consequences for health. I don't think any of this is much of a surprise. Every year, they seem to find one or two more things that um, obesity is related to in terms of health risk. I'm getting more interested in arthritis, including how some of these risk factors in um, kids can play out across the lifespan. So we're starting to see that childhood obesity as well has all of these negative consequences for health way down the line. Um, so in terms of what you actually would want to know about eating behavior in, ter in terms of obesity prevention, we've been thinking a lot about um, overeating in terms of this, where we've got um, We've got exposure to a food cue. It activates reward circuits in the brain. And in the presence of a lack of inhibitory control or self-control, you end up overeating. And that's sort of been what we focused on in a lot of lab studies for a long time. Certainly, a lot of my earlier work did. And um, at least I'm starting to be more and more interested in the upstream choices that lead to these exposures. So for example, you don't just show up, wake up in the morning with a piece of cake next to your bed. That cake got there somehow at an earlier time point. 
So there's what you choose in a food source. There's also how you go about selecting the different food sources that you uh, patronize. And of course, there are decision processes involved once you've been exposed to a food, as well as in the selection of these foods. So I think there's um, reason to look at neurocognitive processes at all different points in the series of decisions that ultimately lead to a piece of cake being in your stomach. And you can quantify this in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, the first question is, where do you get food? Um, we don't do a lot of hunting and gathering anymore, so most of the stuff we get to eat comes from a grocery store, a vending machine, fast food place, so there's the decision of where you're going to eat. And then within each food source, you can talk about what kind of foods are being selected. And then you can quantify what people are choosing to eat. You've got the amount of food they buy, um, diet quality. So diet quality refers to essentially the nutrient con content of the foods that you're ingesting. Um, the most popular way of quantifying this is to apply, um, I think I stepped on a plug. <laughs> OK. All right. What was I saying? Uh, I think you're, I think we were talking about, ah, the HEI, yeah, diet quality. So you can score the diet quality of a set of foods by running them through a nutrient analysis program, and then you take the content of each of those nutrients relative to the dietary guidelines, and that'll give you a continuous score. You essentially end up with a score from zero to 100 on how close a set of foods in someone's diet adheres to the dietary guidelines at that point. So that's one way of quantifying the healthfulness of what someone buys for, for their food. You can also look at energy density. So that's the calories in a gram of food. Turns out that we stop eating due to the mass and volume of food in our stomach, not because of how many calories are in our stomach. So an implication of that is if you can get full on an amount of food that has fewer calories, you're going to be able to, uh, you're going to be more likely to maintain a healthy weight. In contrast, if you can stuff a whole bunch of calories into a small volume of food, you're going to be more likely to gain weight. So you can calculate the energy density of these foods. And there are also questions about, in terms of food purchasing, how all of these things might differ based on behavioral factors, environmental factors, socioeconomic factors. So there's a whole range of things that might influence food purchasing decisions. So um, I have a colleague named Simone French, and she's in Minnesota. And she developed some strategies for uh, documenting food purchases. Um, she basically did this through collecting food receipts and scoring them based on essentially what types of food. So she could classify certain beverages, fruits and vegetables, et cetera. So building on that method, um, we developed a little more detailed approach that involves, again, collecting the food receipts and doing some things to help track the flow of foods from the grocery store into someone's pantry, where you do things like place stickers on all the food packaging and then go into the home and photograph everything they've bought and align those purchases with different information on the food receipt itself. So this involves a lot of work, not only on the part of the participant, but then going to their home, photographing all this stuff, running it through a nutrient analysis program. Um, and in some of Simone's work, she found that two weeks of food purchasing provides an estimate that pretty much mirrors what you would get if you were to do a longer period of time. So our protocol involves four different home visits over a two-week period with a few phone calls in between to sort of remind participants to collect all their uh, food receipts and then keep all the food packaging and throw them in a little bin. Uh, have any of you heard of the USDA's food apps program? So they do a very similar approach where they just give participants a scanner and they scan all the barcodes. Unfortunately, that's going to miss any food that doesn't have a barcode. And it's not going to really do you any good at a restaurant either. So those are important things, fruits and vegetables, meals that you eat out. You really would want to capture that. So unfortunately, there's a little bit of a limitation there. So in our protocol, again, I mentioned we take photographs of the foods. We get the label and the, the brand and the, so you can really identify this product in our nutrition database. Um, here's an example of one of those stickers that would um, be on the product as well as on the food receipt. So we would know that this food came off of receipt number two. And that's going to help us align the data we get on the nutrients here with the price data from the receipt, as well as information on the source of where that food came from. So here's just a little more information. You've got your receipt, 
sticker number two. Here's some of the uh, notes that we would take as researchers in terms of what, what the items are, the size of those foods, how many they bought, what the price was. And then up here we've got information on where they bought it, whether they used different forms of payment. So for example, was this purchased with um, food stamps, EBT for example? Run it through our nutrition database and then apply the healthy eating index. And so that's gonna give us the degree to which purchases from different sources adhere to the dietary guidelines. And in addition to calculating that healthy eating index for diet quality, we also calculate things like the energy density that I mentioned before. So one thing we wanted to learn right off the bat was how closely does someone's food purchasing actually correspond to what they eat? And prior to when we did this last study, there had only been a couple of studies in the literature on that showing that specific nutrients showed moderate association. So for example, the amount of fat purchased by a, a consumer would mirror the amount of fat purchased or, or consumed in that household over a, a certain period of time. So this looks at the entire HEI, so the diet quality of food purchases relative to the diet quality of actual dietary intake. And this is a bland Altman plot. So here we're looking at the average healthy eating index score between the purchases and dietary intake. So this is essentially your range of diet quality. And that is plotted against the difference between the HEI scores for purchases versus intake. So what you'll notice here is that there's really not a lot of bias. The estimates of dietary intake that you get from food purchases is actually quite close on average. And you also don't see that there's any difference, like for example, any tilt to this cloud of points. Had there been a tilt in the cloud of points, it would suggest that across the range of diet quality, you see a, uh, a difference in the, in the bias in the estimate. So we can conclude that food purchasing is a pretty good approximation of dietary intake. So it does support the idea that it's an upstream driver of dietary intake. We also see that food purchasing correlates with body mass. So that's a correlation of about minus 0.27. Significant, but you know, it's not the strongest correlation in the world. One reason for that could be, I mean, one reason is it just may not be that strong of an association in real life. That's always possible. Could also be the fact that we're looking at food purchasing um, that someone made for an entire household and we're relating that to their BMI at a single point in time. So you wouldn't really necessarily expect you know, a really, really strong correlation. Interestingly, we see that while body mass index is correlated with the healthfulness of purchases, it's unrelated to the tendency to, for example, eat out more. That was a little surprising. You would think that, for example, obesity is related to eating out more, more frequent um, uh, dining out at a restaurant. We haven't seen that in this study or in other studies. And when they've looked at that in, in data sets like NHANES, they really don't show a consistent association either. Um, so I find that kind of fascinating, that there's different dietary decisions about where you get your foods and what you purchase that do or don't relate to BMI. And as we'll see later, they also do and don't relate to present bias or other neurocognitive factors. Well, I guess that's a great segue. What's, the question is, what accounts for these differences in food purchasing patterns across individuals? One being present bias. Uh, I think I can skip this, right? Is there anyone here that really needs me to go over this? I think that, I thought I was gonna take this slide out. I, so this is a bird who's got access to three little berries now, <laughs> or a whole bunch of berries way over here, so later at a further distance, and they maybe have to go through some windy areas with snakes. I don't know, I don't know what the point was. You can see why I was gonna take this slide out of here. <laughs> I think the dilemma that we really encounter in terms of humans is a tension between immediate pleasure from food right now versus this long, delayed potential health benefit if they forego that immediate reward. So I think that is kind of where present bias would play in. The question is, in what types of food decisions is this dynamic really at play? Is it in where you choose to go eat? Is it which food you choose? Does it really not affect food purchasing but only affect your intake at the moment when you're actually exposed to food that you're actively eating? So that's some of the, some of the questions that I've, I'm interested in finding out. We use the same discounting task that you guys probably use here. We plot our indifference points just as you probably do here. Um, I can share with you the distribution 
of discounting in our sample here. This is from the study of household purchasing patterns, eating and recreation. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. This sample is a diverse sample of adults who make most of the food purchases in their home. It's diverse in terms of socioeconomic status. It's diverse in terms of race. Uh, we don't think we have a high rate of addiction that's above what you'd expect in the population. So we have our normal amount of accountants or Spock or whomever that doesn't discount any, any rewards. And then we've got our extremely impulsive folks. And this is our median here in the sample. And so the next series of slides are how discounting has related to different components of eating behavior. So one of the first studies I did, we just looked at whether present bias was related to um, consumption of palatable food items in an ad libitum food intake task. Once you have eliminated hunger, <clears throat> so you know, you've got two drives to eat. You've got actual hunger, and then you've got eating for pleasure, sort of a hedonic drive to eat, driven by reward. And the only way to really parse out which of those two drives is at play is to basically satiate people on something that doesn't provide any pleasure. So we brought in some overweight women who um, were interested in going on a diet but hadn't started dieting. And essentially, we stuffed them full of oatmeal with no flavorless oatmeal. And it was just to satiate them in terms of calorie need. And then we had them wait for about 20, 30 minutes for satiety to kick in. And we exposed them to a set of foods. They had some bland foods, in this case, unsalted soup crackers and regular Cheerios. And they were rated lower in palatability than their other foods that were considered more palatable, which were chips and peanuts and chocolate kisses and raisins. Uh, and we, of course, didn't tell them we were measuring what they ate. We just saw what they ate and measured it. You can see what they actually consumed. But the association is that among people in this study who were sensitive to food reward, based on self-report measures, their degree of present bias was associated with the amount of palatable food they consumed, not with the amount of bland food they consumed. If you were not sensitive to food reward, no association with present bias. So we certainly see present bias related to actual intake when you're exposed to food only in the folks who are sensitive to food reward and only for palatable foods. In a similar study, we looked at actual dietary intake in the real world. So in this case, we had them take food records. So they, we gave them portable scales. And for the next week, everything they ate, they had to weigh on the scale. So if they had a sandwich, they had to weigh the bread, they had to weigh the meat, the cheese, the lettuce. They weighed everything, and they recorded it. We ran that through a dietary analysis program. Uh, and we looked at where these foods came from. So we had three types of foods. Uh, we had home prepared foods, so you know, these are things that you would have to in some way bake or cook. Some degree of preparation was involved. We also had ready to eat foods, which involved no preparation other than unwrapping, for example. And then we had away from home foods, which were basically eating out. And what we see here is that um, we looked at both energy density, so calories per gram of food, as well as energy intake per food item. And what we saw was for the ready-to-eat foods and the away-from-home foods, the more present bias folks ate more energy-dense foods, and they ate more calories per item from the away-from-home and ready-to-eat sources. We didn't see any association with home-prepared foods. Any thoughts on why, why that would be? Why present bias folks wouldn't be more impulsive in what they ate with home-prepared foods? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my theory. That's what I think. I mean, you can't impulsively eat something that takes 45 minutes to, to bake, right? So, um, so that was interesting. And it led to the question about what exactly is it about these foods or the, the context that um, makes it vulnerable to the influence of present bias. Those were essentially preliminary data to the Shopper study I, I mentioned before. Um, and the point of this study was to look at present bias and how it relates to a, a large variety of food uh, purchasing decisions from all sources. Um, and to do this kind of at the level of the household. We collected a lot of data on, on the household as well as socioeconomic factors. We ended up with about 204 subjects here. Um, to be eligible, they had to make at least 75% of the purchases for their home. There's this idea that there are these nutrition gatekeepers in every household, you know, households with families. 
where one person, for example, the mom, sort of controls the diet of the other people in the home. So these are important people to figure out how they're making their food purchasing decisions. Uh, the study was in Chicago, and again, we did two weeks of our food receipt collection protocol. I can tell you the nature of the food purchasing data we collected. We ended up analyzing about 12,600 food purchases in our dietary analysis program, um, purchased in 2,340 episodes, so that's trips to the store or trips to a vending machine. Worked out to about 62 foods per subject over two weeks, 11.6 shopping episodes over two weeks. And you buy about 80 pounds of food every two weeks. That's, that was what our typical household bought. And what we find first is that our more impulsive, more present biased folks had considerably lower healthy eating index scores for all of their purchases considered collectively. This is actually a pretty meaningful difference. So if you look at, for example, the top third and the bottom third of this distribution, you're looking at a difference of maybe 10 healthy eating index points. And in epidemiologic studies, uh, that's an amount that's associated with significant increase in mortality risk, that level of difference in terms of um, diet quality. When we looked at the same association with energy density of foods, we again see uh, a pretty striking association with present bias. In the paper that this comes from, we actually worked out what the difference would be in daily calorie intake if we had um, like the top 25th percentile and bottom 25th percentile of present bias purchasing foods. And it works out to something like 150 calories a day difference. Uh, for a present biased individual compared to a less present biased individual. And that would, if you took the standard um, but totally inaccurate myth of 3,500 calories per pound and extrapolated that out, it would be something like 10 pounds a year of, of weight gain. So it's a pretty meaningful effect as well. Um, eating out was about 11% of the total calories that people bought in the study. But just like in the study I mentioned before, we didn't see any association with present bias. Not at all. Um, so we have done some work on socioeconomic differences in purchasing. It turned out to be really nice that in the shopper study we had a really socioeconomically diverse sample. And there have been a number of studies on this. So uh, generally speaking, lower income homes buy less healthy foods. Uh, they buy fewer fruits and vegetables. They buy more caloric beverages. It's thought that that's related to their greater risk for obesity in uh, disadvantaged populations. Um, Simone and I did an analysis of the socioeconomic differences in purchasing in the shopper study, and we saw pretty much the same patterns. So, you know, we see differences in the total healthy eating index score, and that really tended to be driven by fruits and vegetables and things like whole grains. So we're seeing the same pattern of socioeconomic differences. Uh, we also, in the same data set, and just like in pretty much any national data set, we see socioeconomic differences in obesity. Um, this is household income quintiles, with the highest income being five. So again, this is a significant association that we see in NHANES and all the other data sets. We also saw pretty striking um, socioeconomic differences in present bias. I'm sure you've seen the, the same type of pattern in your work. Uh, that's a pretty impressive graph, I think. That's a large difference. So the question is, to what extent does present bias account for socioeconomic differences in purchasing and in, in body mass index? So I'm going to screw this up pretty significantly. I know there are a few statisticians in here. But we tried to take the difference in diet quality between those with and without financial hardship, and we defined that based on some uh, income metrics that they were reporting in our study. So there was a diet quality gap of 7.4 points on the healthy eating index. And we used OACA blinder decomposition analysis to take that gap and try to account for it from a whole variety of different variables, including you know, other socioeconomic factors like education, um, food insecurity, things that you say, well, maybe that's why low-income folks have poor diet quality. It turned out that of all the variables we considered, present bias was the strong, accounted for the most uh, variability, the most difference between those with and without financial hardship. So this kind of supports the idea that 
Present bias might account for some of these socioeconomic differences in purchasing patterns. This is actually for um, actual dietary intake. But when you do the same thing for the food purchasing patterns, you get the pretty much the exact same results. Before I move on, I, Warren and I were talking the other day, last night actually, about the idea of life history theory, the idea that growing up in a disadvantaged or impoverished uh, context sets up your brain to be more present biased. And that might be one way that the environment affects adulthood food choices and puts people at risk for obesity and other chronic diseases through present bias. So I'm really, I'm really jazzed about that idea and really excited about it. I just wanted to point that out before moving on. OK, so one question is, what might we do if present bias turns out to be a, a viable intervention target? One idea would be episodic future thinking. I think you guys are familiar with that. And there's good people working on that, so I won't cover that. Another option would be to consider commitment strategies or commitment contracts. Are you guys, any of you familiar with commitment strategies? A couple? OK. So um, Howard Racklin is someone that developed a lot, of, a lot of this work, a lot of it from animal studies. But the idea is if you're present biased and you're exposed to something tempting, you're likely to experience a preference reversal and um, in the heat of the moment, make a decision that's not in your best long-term interests. The idea would be to try to do something in advance to prevent yourself from making a poor decision in the future when you're tempted, before present bias has a chance to influence your decisions. So the, the idea would be at an early decision point, decision point one, before you're tempted, you're going to go down one of two paths. If you go down the commitment contract path or the commitment strategy path, you're going to go down a road that only allows you one option, the healthy option. If you don't take advantage of um, a commitment contract, you go down the regular old path where you're exposed to temptation and you're likely to be vulnerable to present bias and overeat or have, a, have another cigarette. So one prototypical example of that would be the kitchen safe. Uh, basically, it's a container. You can put your vices in it, and it locks it up until um, a certain time goes by. So for example, um, if you're a smoker, maybe you have a cigarette, you're satiated, you come to the realization you want to quit smoking, so you lock your cigarettes up in the kitchen safe. Or you, if you're on a diet, you lock the, the uh, Twinkies up in the safe or your video game controller or whatever it is. You lock it up and you set it to go off for like three or four hours later. And during that period of time, you really don't have to worry about self-control because you've made a decision in advance before you're in a tempted state. So there's a whole variety of ways that this could play out that I'm not going to go into. I just wanted to illustrate this as one idea. Did any of you watch Shark Tank? So this was on Shark Tank, the kitchen safe. I just think that's interesting. OK, so the last thing I was going to mention was the idea that you could try to come up with strategies that engineer healthy preference reversals um, into the environment in a way that precludes present bias from influencing our decisions. And the one I'm going to talk about in particular is the vending machine study, um, the one where we used time delays as an intervention. The premise being, if this is your subjective value for two different food alternatives, so one being a chocolate bar, one being a granola bar, if both are available at the same time, there's a lot of folks out there that would probably prefer a chocolate bar. If you can delay the delivery of that chocolate bar, you can potentially have a brief moment right before the granola bar would be immediately available where it's actually preferred to the chocolate bar. So that's sort of creating a preference reversal in the healthy direction. So the, you know, this was an interesting idea. And then the question was like, what are you going to do to test that one? You can't just like hold the snack <laughs> and give it to them. So you have to come up with a strategy. And I was a big Skinner fan, BF Skinner. And you know, he had all those different special cages he built with rats that would you know, operate chambers and, and things like that. And the closest analog that we have that an IRB would probably approve, other than putting people in a Skinner box, would be something like a vending machine. There's a lot of advantages. You can standardize the presentation of all the different food rewards. You can manipulate the prices. And more importantly, we tried to figure out a way that you can actually delay the delivery of the less healthy snacks. 
So the way we tried to do this is um, in a system that we ended up calling disk delays to influence snack choice. First thing you have to do is let the consumer know what's a regular snack or a healthy snack. That's got to be clear. So we labeled the side of the machine and color coded them. So we got regular snacks in red and they're all on top. I'll explain why that had to be the case. And then we had our healthy snacks in green that were all on the bottom. Um, so there's definitely a color coding here and some signage. There's also a touch screen. It turns out with the Affordable Care Act, they required that vending machines list the calorie information for all the snacks in the machine. And it would be really difficult to present that information on, for example, a little card in each of these slots. And you wouldn't want to have to turn all the packages around to show the label. So the way a lot of companies did this is they create a little touch screen. Um, touch screen LED here, and you can basically flip through it. So what we did is we had the uh, main screen explain that they may have to wait for a snack, regular snacks, vend after a delay, et cetera. And if they wanted more information, they could touch this part here, and it would start to describe exactly what, what the heck we're talking about. Um, in addition to that, we had to come up with a, a mechanism to actually delay the delivery of the regular snacks. We tried to program the machine's circuit board to basically hold the snack until a 25 second delay expired and then drop it. To do that, you would need a vending machine company to give you the schematics to their circuit board and permission to modify their machine. They didn't want to do that. So we ended up having to come up with a different system that's essentially a platform. So if someone bought a regular snack, it would drop onto the platform. That's why we had to put the regular snacks on top. Uh, there are infrared lights that are shooting across the platform. So a snap drops, it, it breaks the beam. That's detected by a sensor, and that activates a 25-second countdown. And that countdown can be seen right here if you're, if you're the consumer. And at the end of the delay, the snack just drops, and that's it. That's the whole story. We didn't have a way to, for example, allow people to change their mind during the delay. That's something we really want to do, but we didn't have the ability to do it. Um, and then, of course, if you bought a healthy snack, it would just plop right out, would skip the platform altogether and just bypass the system. Uh, when we first started the study, we had this built. We had to figure out, well, how long of a delay? And I, I've been asking a few of you since uh, over the course of time that I've been here. Some of you thought 25 seconds was an extraordinary long period of time, and some of you laughed that that would never affect your decision. I'll just tell you why we ended up going with 25 seconds. We basically did a little pilot study where uh, me and some of the research assistants walked around the hospital with coupons for free snacks. And we just started handing them out. And we had people go to the machine and purchase whatever they wanted. Um, but we had the machine set at all types of different delays. So we had basically a zero delay, so immediate snacks, uh, immediate vending for all snacks, all the way up to 30 seconds. And essentially what we found is that once you get to about 25 seconds, you really don't see any additional improvement in the rate of healthy snack purchasing. We also monitored when people said, you know what, I wouldn't even wait for this anymore. I would rather just turn in my coupon for a dollar bill. We thought that would be kind of analogous to someone saying, I'm not going to wait to use this machine anymore. So based on that, we went with 25 seconds. Then in our main study, uh, the first thing we did was arrange the snacks in a fixed order. We wanted the snacks to be in the same location throughout the entire study, regardless of uh, what condition we were doing. We ended up collecting data from over 32,000 VENs. That's adequate sample size. Uh, and then we did this study in three different locations on the Rush campus. We had a public site that was essentially the lobby of uh, the entrance to the main hospital. We had a blue collar location that was essentially a, br a break room for like our janitorial staff and the shipping receiving folks. And then we had one in an office building. Uh, so we ran the same series of conditions in each of those locations. We ended up um, having so many vending sales in the public location that we stopped it. So they had to restock that machine twice a day. So when the machine's completely empty, it's going to always be 50% healthy, 50% regular. So we didn't really see a lot of value in, in analyzing that. That said, whether or not we include those data, we get the same results. So we ran, uh, we want, again, wanted to test the effects of time delay. So the baseline condition is everything's the same price with no delays. We did a dual baseline uh, design here. 
Then we ran the study with a 25 cent discount, which is kind of your standard default vending machine intervention. Uh, then we did it with equal pricing with the delay. We combined the delay and the discount. And then based on an NIH reviewer's comment, we added a whole separate condition that is still a 25 cent difference between healthy and regular, but now it's a tax. So it's $1.25 for junk food and a dollar for regular. And then we combine the tax with the delay. And each of these ran for about four weeks in each of the locations. Uh, so the, the punchline is, you know, if you add a 25 second delay, you get a small but noticeable effect on healthy purchasing. It goes from about 40 to 43 percent. Um, it's significant. And it turns out to be roughly the same level of effect you get with a 25 cent discount. So, you know, a lot of work sites that have a vending machine program, they want money from the machine. That's one of the incentives for having a vending program. They also like healthy vending programs. So the nice thing here is I think what we're seeing is that a delay can get you roughly the same benefit in terms of healthy vending as you get with a discount, but it won't cost you any money. Combining the delay and the discount actually had an additive benefit roughly. You would think that someone that was susceptible to a nudge might just change their opinion with either of these two, but it turns out that you get an additive benefit when you combine those two together. Um, I think the most surprising finding from the study is that the tax actually had a giant effect. And one thing to point out is that in this vending machine, you couldn't use a credit card. They have new machines that you can actually purchase uh, snacks with a credit card. So the implication is that with the junk food being $1.25, you're going to be left with either three quarters, you're going to have to have $2 bills or two forms of currency. So I, we think that that was sort of a discouraging factor that would have led people to choose the healthy snack. And then combining the delay and the, the tax really didn't have much of a difference here. So all of that is, the outcome here is the percent of healthy sales. But in terms of feasibility, you know, everyone wants people to choose healthier foods. But in terms of feasibility, what really matters is this, is this going to affect sales? Is this going to affect the amount of snacks sold as well as revenue? So we obviously monitored that. None of these differences are, are statistically significant. Turns out that, for example, the delay sold just as many snacks as when you have no intervention. Um, if anything, adding the delay and the discount together might have had a tiny negative impact on sales. What's interesting from the perspective of a vending machine operator, the people who get most of the money from these machines, is that you do indeed see um, the discount harming revenue relative to just the delay alone or, or no intervention. And the tax may have a slightly higher or, or neutral effect on vending revenue. So I, I guess the takeaway is that it does sort of prove the principle that time delays operate just like any other economic intervention and that it can nudge people in a healthy direction, proves that principle. I think it's an interesting idea to think about how you could generalize that to other settings outside of vending. For example, fast food or the grocery store, you could come up with some maybe some creative ways where um, you've got a smart cart that tracks the healthfulness of everything in your cart, and if you hit some threshold of healthiness, you get to go to the express checkout line or something like that. I don't know. Just, I'm just making this up as I go, if you can't tell. Uh, I can tell you an interesting update is this study ended about two years ago and I didn't do anything with it. I didn't have a vending machine partner that was willing to let me mess with their circuitry of the, of the boards and uh, make this produced on a, a larger scale. I think the next study would have to be more than one machine. We'd probably need a do at least a dozen machines to do this right. Um, then one day I got a phone call from some health consultant in Florida who says, I do evaluations for corporations that want to have healthy vending and modify their health insurance programs and have employee wellness stuff going on. And I've been telling them about this time delay machine, and they want to buy a whole bunch of them. Are you ready? I said, well, I don't make them. Uh, but let me call some companies. So I, I called up one, one that I had tried to build a relationship with before, and their ears perked up. So it may actually turn out to be the case that um, that they commercialize this pretty soon. They say it's pretty easy to make this. The time delay just involves um, manipulating a couple of, well, I don't know what they are. They manipulate something in the circuit board, something with a relay or something like that. So we'll see how it goes. I, I guess I'm interested to see if um,
they actually end up in the real world? And if so, if I can collect some data on how that goes. Overall conclusions, I'd say that present biased eating behavior seems to be greatest for rewarding foods rather than just any old food or bland foods for sure. And it seems to be specific to reward sensitive people, those that are specifically sensitive to food reward. Um, I think what's interesting is it does seem to affect upstream behaviors like food purchasing decisions that do trickle down to affect eating behavior and obesity risk. And I'm definitely interested in seeing whether this plays a role in some of the socioeconomic disparities we see in um, chronic disease, obesity, and, and things like that. And then we just mentioned time delays as one of several strategies that may specifically target present bias in terms of chronic disease prevention. So that's all I have for today. So thanks uh, for your time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did look into that. So there are a few things that I can uh, tell you off the top of my head. So one is the baseline rate of healthy food purchasing was much lower in the blue collar location. I believe the difference was something like 25% of the snacks in that location were healthy versus something like 50% in the white collar. So it was quite a stark difference. Then we see that the um, time delays and the, pricing inter the simple pricing interventions had a stronger effect in the blue collar settings. So they were more, I think that would be a greater elasticity of demand in that setting compared to the white collar. Interestingly, we didn't see a difference when you did the um, combination time delays and taxes. It could just be that that's such a, I don't want to say powerful, but it's, it's a, a level of intervention that's strong enough to maybe overcome the, the difference in those two locations. Um, and it made me really interested to know, like, what ex we didn't measure anything about individuals as they made these decisions. I, I would have loved to have a camera there to, or a scale on the floor or all types of uh, contraptions. Um, but you do wonder, like, what are some, how would a present biased individual respond to this intervention versus someone who isn't. I did actually um, hang out by the machine every now and then, and I, the reactions were quite different. Some people, you know, I would, I would not tell them, of course, that this was our unit. And some people would say, oh, this is pretty clever. You know, it's pretty cool. And other people were enraged by it. Um, every now and then, someone was just confused by it. I, my heart broke when I saw this old elderly couple trying to figure it out, and there's, like they came out of the medical suite and there, there's a walker and I think I heard her say, I'm really hungry. <laughs> and it was really sad. They did get their snack, but what's going on? I don't know. I'm so hungry. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Yeah, let me think. I'm, I, I certainly know that, um, in general, those behavioral economic interventions that focus on optimizing the defaults generally do work. Um, you know, I, I wonder. I'm thinking about how to how to implement that in a vending machine, for example. Like, would it would you just pick like the uh, baked chips, or, or would how would you do it? But uh, I'm not sure. It's this. It's the. Is it convenience? Like, is this time delay thing, is it about the preference reversal? Is it about that? Or is it about just the convenience of wanting something immediate? And I really don't know the answer. I, I think it might be in, informa in useful information to help parse that out. Yeah, I don't have, yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, what comes to mind as you say that is, is um, for example, like I'm thinking of our, our weight management clinic. Uh, if, yeah, people are just focused on when they get to their goal weight, that's a long wait. And we, we try to get them to focus on something that's a little bit immediately gratifying in the moment. So enjoying the exercise they're doing or enjoying some healthy food that they've prepared themselves or at least trying to enjoy the increase in physical function and just how they feel as they go through this rather than just focusing on their long-term goal of weight. So, I mean, I guess to some extent that's trying to take, uh, instead of focusing on foregoing immediate pleasure for a long-term health outcome, you're at least now pitting immediate pleasure versus a different immediate reward from, for example, something healthy. I guess that's the best I would say. I don't know if others would agree with that or, or not. That's my, my take on it. Mm-hmm. And so I guess when I saw that, I was thinking just this framing effects for like loss of weight and gain. Do you think that would, like, was that an explanation that you would like, think of playing with that or yeah. not? I would not because in both cases, the difference was 25 cents. And this was not something that people um, were uh, essentially already putting up and then receiving any money back. In fact, from someone that had just used the machine for the first time in either condition, they would just think that's the price. You know, $1.25 versus $1 or $1 versus 75 cents. Same difference in price, the only difference being the need for two forms of currency. That's the only explanation I come up with. I think what's interesting is now that they have all these machines that you can just use your credit card, I'd be really curious to see if that sort of eliminates that effect of the tax versus the discount. I don't know. That's all I got on that one. I mean, we were really surprised to even see that effect. It was completely unexpected. I guess that maybe that NIH reviewer that required us to do that had a, some experience or insight that led to that. So meaning 75 cents for healthy, $1.25 for junk, regular snacks. You mentioned the drop in, a little bit of the drop in revenue when the discount was in place yeah. compared to the small potential increase in revenue mm -hmm. when the tax was in place. So yeah, I mean, if the, I would say, so the, uh, with the discount, we see the same number of snacks purchased. It's just since we're charging less, you're going to get less money for those snacks. I don't know. If, if they were layered, in other words, um, rather than a dollar, it's 75 cents for a healthy snack, a dollar 25 for a regular snack, I would think that would have a stronger effect. Um, but I don't know how I would know whether that's due to the uh, price differential or if it's due to the I guess you'd have to do every combination ab above and below a dollar, like 90 cents and a dollar 10, and see if it's about the magnitude of that difference or if it's about just the amount of, of change in your pocket. Or to, again, do it with a credit card machine that doesn't even require any of that. Yeah, the, re the manuscript reviewers had these same, the same questions. Yeah, yes. Yeah.
This guy here? Oh, OK. Yep. These guys. Yeah, so none of the, neither of these are the percent of total calories from these sources. This here means that of the home prepared foods, you know, on average it was about 1.9 calories per gram. It, it didn't vary significantly across the range of delayed discounting. Yeah. And if anything, it was in the opposite direction. I mean, it wasn't significant, but. Yes. It's tricky because uh, I can tell you that of the overweight kids that exist now, 80% of them will transition or will stay overweight as adults. So only 20% are going to essentially have normalization of weight. We know that the prevalence of childhood obesity is about you know, 18 20%. And we know that once you're an adult, the prevalence is 66%. So we know that statistic. What we can't, the reason I can't answer your question is because the prevalence of obesity at a population level has changed so much. So, so the obesity epidemic has just come on. It's almost like the entire uh, boat rose at the same time across all age groups. So um, the question of what percentage of current adults were overweight as kids isn't really clear to me. It's great. I wonder why you asked that question, actually. Consequences uh, like cardiometabolic consequences, or I was talking about this with someone the other day that um, it's not really clear because in kids we don't see that your weight gain or weight loss, for example, affects blood pressure. Uh, if you have high blood pressure as a kid, it's usually some kidney problem. Whereas in adults, you do start to see an association between weight and blood pressure. So a lot of the cardiometabolic effects of obesity don't manifest for a while. It's probably not because of age per se as much as the duration of obesity. In fact, there's this idea of, uh, I might say, uh, an idea that's fading of metabo metabolically healthy obesity. And the more they look into this idea that there are some folks with obesity who don't show any of the metabolic problems with it, turns out it's just because they haven't been overweight or obese long enough for those problems to manifest. So there does seem to be some kind of lag time uh, or accumulation of um, cardiometabolic risk that comes with duration of obesity. Yeah, so like, like you said, we certainly see that with arthritis and cardiometabolic risk as well. So that's one important reason why you do want to do something about childhood obesity because if the longer you can delay um, the onset of that, the, the better chances you have in adulthood. In terms of weight loss? I believe it does not really matter, actually. So for example, they've looked at the degree of metabolic compensation as a function of duration of obesity. And beyond a relatively short time frame, like one year versus five years, they don't really see a strong difference there. My opinion would be that what's going to make it easier or more difficult to lose weight, no matter how long you've been overweight, is the, the dietary and physical activity contributions to energy balance. So, 
I've seen plenty of people who are, you know, quite really high BMI, but most of it's because they drink a lot of soda. And that one change can really make a huge difference. Whereas someone who just kind of overeats at every meal, that's going to be a lot harder to, to see change in. Yeah. I don't know that. That's a good question. Nope. <laughs> yes. To obesity or to? I thought I saw some heritability to discounting. Which? Oh. I don't know of a genetic variant that's common to both present bias and obesity. That would be a common factor, like a common genetic contribution of both. That I don't, I've never seen that. That would be great to know that. Yes. This guy? Yeah, in fact, that was constant across all conditions. So they, the, the signage, healthy, regular, all the, everything was identical across all of them. So I did not, though, have a chance to compare this baseline with the sales before we did anything. In fact, we, we bought a whole new machine and everything for the study. Yeah. So the same jump up as the signage? No. Though I do know that our, our baseline healthy per percent of healthy VENs was similar within a few percentages of what it had been. But I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes? So, sorry, I just have enough for three or four questions. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I would think addiction would be an example of one where it probably would be, but um, I don't have any, I certainly don't have any data on that. I can, I can certainly think, though, of people that have had really long-standing problematic health behaviors that were relatively easy. So, for example, I'm thinking of switching from regular soda to diet soda. Some people do that pretty easily, and it's almost like the thought never occurred to them. But that's much less of an addictive behavior than, you know, heroin, obviously. I don't know. How, how is my response to that question? Was that all right? <laughs> no data. I have no data. I, I would have liked to. The reason I couldn't is the way that we got our sales data is they get downloaded in, all at once when the operator goes in. They basically plug in this device. It just pulls all the sales, but no timestamp. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's thank our, our guests. Uh, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, that's fun. You know, I, uh, I should have connected.